Andrew Shore on location in downtown Seattle as we continue our discussion with noted myeloma expert, Dr. James Berenson, who's in town lecturing to physicians in the area. He spoke to us about myeloma, but in this segment, we're gonna talk about what may be described as pre-myeloma or MGUS. Let's move on to what might be described as pre-myeloma or MGUS. What is it? How common is it? And how worrisome is it? Well, believe it or not, this is much, much more common than myeloma. In fact, my own father-in-law was diagnosed back about 10, 15 years ago. This is a condition in which individuals have also the same monoclonal or M protein that you see in myeloma, although it's smaller in size. They have less plasma cells in their bone marrow, but again, they have the same monoclonal antibody you see in myeloma, the same marker. But what they don't have is they don't have holes in their bones that are the hallmark of myeloma. They don't have kidney failure. They don't have anemia, and they don't have high calcium. It is now been demonstrated that MGUS is associated with certain other conditions. Number one, bone loss. People who are age matched with MGUS to other normal control studies done in Europe and Mayo Clinic clearly demonstrate a higher risk of bone loss in people who have MGUS and also a higher risk of fracture. Second, patients have a higher risk of blood clots heart attacks, but more commonly blood clots in the lungs and so-called deep venous thrombos, cl thrombosis clots in the lower legs. There are some, but not all, studies that suggest that patients with MGUS have a higher risk of peripheral neuropathy, numbness, tingling, feet, hands. For example, my father-in-law, that's how he presented. He had a peripheral neuropathy, and as part of the workup, it was clearly demonstrated he had a monoclonal gammopathy. So, you have MGUS, like an older man might have prostate cancer, but does that mean that that's what's going to lead to your demise, or are you maybe just going to live with it? Good question. So, what's the risk of an MGUS patient getting myeloma? Well, let's look at it the other way around. How many patients with myeloma started with MGUS? Well, two studies done in Washington, one among U.S. veterans, one a large screening study following patients over time who had their blood collected many years ago, and they got myeloma, then they went way back and looked at their blood, they all had MGUS. So pretty much we know that upwards of 95% of people with myeloma started with MGUS. So then asking the question the other way around, what's the likelihood of an MGUS patient getting myeloma? The risk is about half to 1% per year. But given that MGUS, like myeloma, is a disease of the elderly, the older you get, the higher the risk, most MGUS patients never develop myeloma. They don't live long enough to develop it. But if you're 40 with MGUS, you've got a lot of years to get there. It's a little bit more worrisome than if you're like my father-in-law who was 80. Well, let's talk about risk categories of MGUS. Who's at higher risk to develop myeloma? Who's at lower risk? Well, patients who have non-IgM, specifically IgG or IgA, are at lower risk to develop a serious disorder. In the case of IgM, it's usually not myeloma, it's macroglobulinemia, although rarely it can be myeloma. Those people are at higher risk. So if you have an IgM type, you seem to be at higher risk to develop a bad thing. Number two, if you have a higher M protein, a higher level of that, monoclonal protein, more than one and a half grams, you're probably at higher risk. And if you have circulating cells in the blood that are abnormal, you're at a higher risk that are the same type as the myeloma cells, but they've gotten out of the bone marrow in the blood. And some people claim that if you have a free light assay that's disturbed, it's off and abnormal, that also suggests you're at higher risk to develop myeloma. So those people seem to be at higher risk than people who without those features. So the question is, what do you do with MGUS? It's not really cancer, although you're at higher risk. Well, we've done studies to prevent bone loss in the group at high risk. That is patients who've had bone density measurements and either have osteopenia or osteoporosis. That is, they have clear bone loss, like an elderly female after the menopause. We've given them Zometa or Zoledronic acid every six months and demonstrated large increases in bone strength. Have those been associated with a reduction in the risk of developing myeloma? 
way too small studies. In order to do that study, we'd have to have 10,000 patients and probably 20 years of follow-up, undoable. So our philosophy with MGUS is, look at bone density, if it's abnormal, put those patients on IV Zometa every six months, which is different than the schedule we use for myeloma patients where we give it every month, and different for an elderly osteoporotic patients without cancer MGUS in which we give it once a year. So we kind of do a middle ground, and it seems to help bone density, but again, we really don't have the data to say it prevents myeloma. So someone with MGUS, though, just like with osteoporosis, measuring bone density on a regular basis would be appropriate. Yes, I think that's a key point, is these people are at higher risk for having enhanced bone loss, and they should be followed like you would an elderly woman with osteoporosis. On the other hand, really importantly, there's really no reason to follow bone density in a myeloma patient, especially if you're going to put them on Zometa anyway, because regardless of which direction your bone density measurements are going to go, you're not going to stop the drug. You can't do any better. Dr. Berenson, we got several questions from people, both related to myeloma and premyeloma, MGUS. Is there a hereditary connection? What's your opinion? There's data now that's come out, especially from the Mayo Clinic studies in Olmsted County, showing that there is a higher risk of both MGUS and myeloma if you have a first degree relative that is a father, mother, brother, sister with myeloma. There is a higher risk several fold, but you have to remember this is a pretty uncommon cancer, so it doesn't mean every patient who goes out there has a brother or sister that's going to get myeloma, but I've certainly seen it. I've also seen husbands and wives with it, which is more intriguing. Is that environmental? Is it infectious? This is also true in premyeloma or MGUS. Patients who have MGUS in the family are more likely to have myeloma and or MGUS. Hmm. But again, low risk. Low risk, not something you should be overly concerned about. Is there some test a family member should rush out and have as if you know somebody had breast cancer or ovarian cancer in the family and you worry about a genetic connection there? Probably not. Uh, I, I think if you have several relatives, maybe that's the case, but maybe not with one relative. Uh, if you have a whole high total protein or something on a routine chemistry, or you have protein in the urine, it should be a sign that maybe something should be tested further. It's a pretty simple test to see if you have a monoclonal protein. You separate the proteins electrophoretically, and you see if there's an extra spike of the monoclonal protein that shouldn't be there as it isn't in, in people without monoclonal gammopathies. The other area of uh, interest for people is if they have an autoimmune condition. MS might be one, Sjogren's, maybe even lupus. Are they at higher risk for myeloma or MGUS? So I think that's the case. And the other thing to add in, we completed a large statewide study in California among women with myeloma and family history of lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, also those patients are at higher risk to get myeloma. So if you have a family member with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren syndrome, you are going to be at higher risk to have myeloma. And among patients who have monoclonal gammopathies, they seem to have more often lupus and other autoimmune disorders. Are we talking about much higher risk? I won't say much higher risk, but there's some risk. The other thing you should know is these autoimmune disorders there are immune disorders, essentially. And what is myeloma? It's a cancer of an immune type of cell. So all these immune cells are overreacting in a person with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. So one of those cells making the antibodies can go a little nuttier, and then it becomes one that is growing and dividing a monoclonal, cl or monoclonal population, if you will, making one type of antibody, and you get a monoclonal protein. But it doesn't necessarily mean those people are ever going to get myeloma. But I certainly have a number of patients, one I just saw in clinic, who has lupus and has myeloma. So just pulling all this together, Dr. Berenson, it sounds like things are moving in myeloma. And with this pre-myeloma, you're studying that as well. There's a lot of knowledge that's accruing and uh, hope for people. First of all, if you have MGUS, don't freak out, because right. if you're older, you may live with it, but not die from it. And if you have myeloma, there are a range of treatments to be considered. Sometimes the old standbys are just fine, and you have other existing ones and others that are coming that may be even combined. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Remember, we're producing a whole Ask Dr. Berenson series, as well as we'll be doing interviews with many other physicians, including at the big American Society of Hematology meeting in December. So if you want to be in the know, sign up for our alerts, give us your email address, and we'll make sure you know as soon as we post new programs, as well as always, we welcome your questions. On location in Seattle, I'm Andrew Shore.